welcome back. Uh, this, again, should be a really short video. Um, in this video, we're actually going to discuss the mechanism of isocitrate dehydrogenase. In the last video, we, or at least some of the last videos, we saw how we generate isocitrate, but we're actually going to look, look at how it's consumed, and we're going to see at this point how you actually take a six carbon molecule and break it down to a five carbon molecule. And later on, we're actually going to break it down even further. Okay. Um, and we're also going to try to, I'm trying to help you establish the role of cofactors by looking at the role of manganese in this enzyme. Welcome back. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about the mechanism of isocitrate dehydrogenase. And that reaction is this right here isocitrate dehydrogenase. So we're going to take isocitrate from the previous reaction and we're going to perform an oxidative decarboxylation. What that means is that it's going to be a net redox reaction, but in the process we're going to decarboxylate. And as we'll find, what's going to happen is the first step is going to be the oxidation of isocitrate, and then the final step is going to be decarboxylation. And what we're going to find also is this is a manganese dependent enzyme, manganese in the 2 plus state. Um, some texts will also include magnesium 2 plus. Um, in this example, I've used manganese as, as, the, as the cation, the cofactor that it requires. But the whole point is that you do need one of these divalent cations to help stabilize one of the enolate intermediates. Okay, so let's start with isocitrate. Now notice one thing about isocitrate. Um, it has a hydroxyl group right here at position two, right? But also at position two, there is a hydride. And that hydride is actually what's going to give us our electrons in the form of NADH. So this molecule right here, and again, I always forget the positive charge in that nitrogen, but uh, this molecule is NAD+. Plus. And I want to be perfectly clear about this also, that it can also be NADP+. So we'll go ahead and put that P in parentheses, meaning that this enzyme can react with both of those. So it's going to start off in the oxidized form. So we're called these right here. These are the oxidized forms. And we're going to pick up the electrons in the form of the hydride. Okay, so there's a base in the active site of isocitrate dehydrogenase. And the base is going to perform a proton transfer right here, okay? And when you deprotonate this oxygen, a carbonyl bond forms and ejects the hydride. Now, in the active site of these dehydrogenases, the hydride is positioned uh, very, very, very much in close proximity to this carbon right here, the carbon that I'm highlighting, okay? So whenever the carbonyl bond forms, that ejects the leaving group, and this hydride comes and attacks this carbon right here, forcing a double bond rearrangement, and this bond ends up as a lone pair on this nitrogen as part of the pyridine ring, okay, of NAD, which is now NADH or NADPH, okay? And so this molecule right here, this is going to be our NAD in parentheses PH, okay? That's our NADH or NADPH depending. Now, in the process of doing this, notice that we form this carbonyl, right? And also recall that on the carbonyl, on the oxygen, there is a partial negative charge, right? So we put a delta negative, okay? And the carboxyl group obviously has a, a full negative charge. And so this manganese ion here, and recall it could also have been magnesium, this manganese ion, helps to stabilize this molecule right here, specifically this part of the molecule that I'm circling. This part of the molecule is stabilized by that manganese ion, okay? You have these negative charges on this molecule, and this molecule is called oxalo, oxalosuccinate. This is oxalosuccinate. The part that I've circled in purple is actually the oxalo part, and the part that I'm about to circle in orange, this is the succinate part, okay? So the part in orange, that's the succinate part. The part in purple is the oxalo part, so it's oxalosuccinate. We'll encounter succinate later in the uh, TCA cycle, okay? But the whole point is that manganese, with its positive charge, helps to stabilize this intermediate. Well, at this point, this is where the decarboxylation is going to occur. So this lone pair on this oxygen of the carboxyl group at position 3, okay, um, this is going to form the pi bond right here, and that's going to cause these electrons to come and attack here, and you're going to generate what's called an enolate. 
okay? And you can see the enolate right here has a full negative charge, and likewise, the carboxyl group still has a negative charge, and it's still stabilized by that manganese ion, okay? You have this, now, now instead of a partial negative charge, it's a full negative charge on this enolate, right? So this group right here, this is your enolate, and the negative charge on that oxygen along with the carboxyl group, is stabilized by the mang manganese ion. Now, recall that enolates, like enols, are not stable. So this will quickly collapse, and a carbonyl bond forms, and then this pi bond comes out and abstracts a proton from this base. And if you recall this base, right, this base was this one right there. So that hydrogen, that, that proton that was originally on the hydroxyl group of isocitrate, that proton is now, it's now at this position right here. Let me go ahead and draw it. So it's now at this position right there. Okay, so that hydride, or excuse me, proton, that proton is right there. Okay, and in the process, what we've ended up generating is this molecule right here. This is called alpha keto, alpha keto glutarate. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as alpha oxo glutarate. Whenever you hear the term keto or oxo, that usually implies there's a ketone. And uh, the alpha implies that it's at the alpha carbon. So this right here, this is your carboxyl carbon. This would be alpha, this would be beta, this would be gamma, and so forth. Okay. And sometimes, sometimes the alpha gets replaced with a 2 because, in fact, it is at position 2. This is position 1 position two, three, four, and five. Now, one thing I do want to point out with this mechanism is recall citrate and isocitrate were how many carbons? They were six carbons, right? In the process of the decarboxylation, which did occur right here, right? The decarboxylation obviously removed one of the carbons. So now we've taken a six carbon molecule and fragmented it down to a five carbon molecule. And alpha ketoglutarate is going to be five carbons. And then in the next step, we're actually going to reduce it down even further to four carbons. So I just wanted to make that point that this is the first step in which we reduce the number of carbons. And actually, it's worth mentioning now. I didn't mention this in the citrate synthase video, but remember, we're condensing acetyl CoA, which is a two carbon molecule, at least the acetyl group is, we're condensing that with oxaloacetate, which is four, and when you condense a two carbon fragment with a four carbon molecule, that gets you a six carbon molecule, okay, which is citrate, and then also isocitrate, okay, and so based on this information right here, sometimes you'll see it as usually alpha ketoglutarate or two oxoglutarate. Those are usually the most common names for this molecule right here. And this molecule right here, as we'll see, is going to get consumed by the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. And mechanistically, that enzyme is exactly the same as the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And I believe we do have a video on that as well. If, if we don't at this point, I'll make one. Okay, so let's just regroup very quickly. Okay, so the first step in isocitrate dehydrogenase's mechanism is the oxidation. Okay, so a base deprotonates this proton right there. There's a formation of a carbonyl bond, and the hydride comes out and attacks NAD plus or NADP plus, and you get either NADH or NADPH. So this molecule right here, this is our reduced cofactor, and it's going to go into the electron transport chain if it's NADH and power NADH dehydrogenase for the pumping of protons. If it's NADPH, it will be used further in biosynthesis. And that gives us this molecule, which is oxalosuccinate, okay? And the partial negative charge on the ketone and the full negative charge on the carboxylate are stabilized by the cofactor, which is a manganese 2 plus ion. But it can also be another divalent cation, magnesium 2 plus, okay? And then, then the decarboxylation occurs in which you form this enolate. This is the, oops, I misspelled it. This is the enolate enolate oxalosuccinate, enolate oxalosuccinate, and it's very unstable, right? Enolates are not terribly stable. They're about the same as enols, but the enolate quickly collapses, and in the process, this pi bond right here comes out and abstracts the proton from the base, and of course, that regenerates the resting state of the base, and therefore, the resting state of the enzyme. 
Okay, so now we've seen the mechanism of isocitrate dehydrogenase. So the first step is a decar is excuse me an oxidation, and the second step is a decarboxylation. So let's take a look at the the reaction that they've drawn in this picture and see if it's correct. What they've drawn is they've drawn, and actually this particular picture, let's see, it looks like they've actually sort of drawn the NADH coming out at the same point that CO2 is coming off, and that's not correct. So we can make a criticism of this picture. Really, it should be about like this, where the NADH comes off first, and then the carbon dioxide comes off, because we know mechanistically the oxidation occurs first, and then the decarboxylation occurs. I hope this video helped you get an intuition on this enzyme. See you in the next video.